Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. Early in the history of this channel, I presented several videos outlining evidence for the presence of a true surface on the sun. If you have not seen these videos, you really need to have a look as they are critical to our changing understanding of the sun. Of course, astronomers must deny the presence of a true solar surface as it is completely incompatible not only with their gaseous plasma standard model but also with their need for black holes and big bangs. In many ways, nothing is more important in effecting a change in astrophysics than the recognition that the Sun has a true surface. The astronomers tell us that the surface of the Sun is nothing but an illusion. They assert that a drastic opacity change occurs at the level of the photosphere in the optical range and that gives the appearance of a real surface. The problem is that there is evidence for a surface over the entire range of the electromagnetic spectrum, not just in the optical. Furthermore, their alleged optical illusion also acts as a real surface. Another problem for astrophysics is that anyone can examine the solar data and decide for themselves if the Sun has a real surface or not. As the public is made aware of what has happened in solar physics, it is not bound by the theoretical restrictions of the astronomers and their outdated models. We do not need physics and math to tell us that a lake has a surface any more than we need solar physicists to tell us that the sun has one. Observational astronomers have long argued for the presence of a true surface on the sun, but have always yielded to the pronouncements of the theoreticians. Here is a quote from Mater dating back to 1913. But under ordinary conditions, we do not see the chromosphere itself, but look down through it on the photosphere, or general radiating surface. This to the eye certainly looks like a definite shell, but some theorists have been so impressed with the difficulty of conceiving that a gaseous body like the Sun could, under the conditions of such stupendous temperatures as there exist, have any defined limit at all, that they deny that what we see on the Sun is a real boundary, and argue that it only appears so to us through the effect of the anomalous refraction or dispersion of light. Such theories introduce difficulties greater and more numerous than those that they clear away, and they are not generally accepted by practical observers of the Sun. Even in 1913, observational astronomers disagreed with the theorists. Yet for nearly 150 years now, astronomy has chosen to disregard direct observational evidence in order to favor theoretical models. You can learn more about the proofs for a solar surface in this paper. Observations must supersede theory, not the other way around. The most powerful evidence for a true solar surface will always be the thermal spectrum of the Sun, as its formation requires the presence of a structural lattice at the level of the photosphere. I have discussed this in detail in these papers. I have also outlined the issues in these videos. As a result, Today, I want to return briefly to helioseismology. I discussed the topic already in this video. Now before we begin, let us examine something relative to seismology on Earth, namely the types of waves that can occur during an earthquake. As we do this, remember that the Earth is condensed matter, it's not a gas. Therefore, seismology is a science of condensed matter. There are two main types of waves in seismology that can travel in a body. First, there is a P wave, which is a longitudinal wave, or a compression wave. In this case, the direction of energy propagation is the same as the direction of motion of the underlying structure. Secondly, we can have an S wave, or transverse wave, where the direction of energy propagation is perpendicular to the direction of motion. Now when P and S waves reach the surface of the Earth, they can combine to produce Raleigh or Love waves. A Raleigh wave is a surface wave with circular motion. It has both longitudinal and transverse components, but no net transverse component. The motion is circular, whereas a Love wave has horizontal motion that is transverse. Love waves are produced by the interference of S waves at the surface. Note that propagation of S waves typically occurs in a solid on Earth, as one must have an organized lattice structure. 
in the metallic hydrogen model of the Sun, an organized lattice also exists, despite the liquid appearance of the photosphere. I had addressed this in this paper. Of course, on the scale of solar dimensions, even material with the rigidity of a solid on Earth, for instance with a high elastic modulus, might well appear to behave macroscopically as a liquid on the photosphere. One thing is clear, no gas can support propagation of a transverse wave, and neither can the gaseous models of the Sun. A gaseous Sun cannot support S waves, and therefore cannot support Raleigh waves or Love waves. In this video I discussed helioseismology and the presence of what appears to be transverse waves on the surface of the Sun. The authors of the associated paper write, we have also detected flare ripples, circular wave packets propagating from the flare and resembling ripples from a pebble thrown into a pond. But a gaseous sun cannot support capillary waves, which are surface waves like ripples on a pond. Capillary waves require both surface tension and gravity to be produced. They are not perfectly transverse in nature, but involve a combination of longitudinal and transverse components. Since a gaseous sun does not have surface tension, it can never produce a capillary wave. Furthermore, in the standard solar model, the photosphere has a density of only 10 to the minus 7 grams per centimeter cubed. That is the density of a vacuum, and one cannot do seismology in a vacuum. Now in this paper, you will see that the SOHO team had predicted that the sun might produce the ripple on the pond pattern effect before it was even detected on the Sun. Yet they are quick to admit that the waves on the Sun were 10 times stronger than they had expected, as you can learn in this link. A factor of 10 is not a trivial amount. You might think, wow, we can get such a pattern in a plasma, but unfortunately the calculations never assumed that the solar body was a gaseous plasma. It simply treated it essentially like a gas. All the helioseismic calculations at the level of the photosphere and in the solar interior involve exclusively hydrodynamics and P waves. That is a science of fluids. The familiar alpha and transverse waves of plasmas are never involved when helioseismology is applied to the solar body. Note also that in this case no strong magnetic fields exist on the sun at this point, yet the ripples could be made a sure sign that these ripples were not formed in a gaseous plasma, as gaseous plasmas in the absence of magnetic fields cannot support transverse waves. In the standard solar model, helioseismology cannot support transverse waves, and physicists must invoke P waves which are longitudinal to explain everything. So what did they do? Here is a sentence that gives us a clue. It was suggested long ago, Wolf 1972, that solar flares, giant explosions on the Sun, may cause acoustic waves traveling through the Sun's interior, similar to seismic waves on the Earth. Because the sound speed increases with depth, the waves are reflected in the deep layers of the Sun and appear on the surface, forming expanding rings of the surface displacement. They further argue that a high pressure compression produced at the atmosphere produces a downward propagating shock wave that hits the solar surface and causes sunquakes. Do you get the problem here? For the solar physicists, there is no solar surface. That boundary is only imaginary, a product of opacity changes. A gaseous sun has no surface. It is hard to strike a surface that does not even exist. This is an example of the complete disconnect between physical reality and mathematical conjecture. Here is an illustration of what they are claiming. A disturbance above the photosphere strikes the solar surface. That then results in a propagation of P waves into the solar interior. Those P waves are then magically reflected within the Sun at a distinct boundary that cannot exist because a gaseous plasma Sun has no internal layers. Next, the P wave travels back up to the surface producing the transverse waves needed. That physics is completely different than the physics that takes place in the ripples on a pond. The solar physicists are using longitudinal P waves in order to mimic the effect 
properly seen in capillary waves which they cannot support. It is not reasonable to expect that P waves originating from reflections in the solar interior would produce perfect circles on the solar surface and maintain their geometric perfection as they expand. Again, this has absolutely nothing in common with ripples on a pond. Ripples on a pond have transverse components which were not produced by P waves traveling deep inside the lake and reflecting back onto the surface. The entire explanation by solar physics is not reasonable. It exists only because they must keep denying the condensed nature of the sun and its true surface. Solar physicists do so even though they must have recourse to a surface in order to create their disturbance in the first place. Next, have a look at this image taken by the solar satellite. Note how even within sunspots we are getting circular arcs. The rings die out in regions between the spots but are still maintaining their arc even in the penumbra near the center of the sunspots. When ripples are seen in the penumbra of the sunspot, no distortion of the circular ring is observed even though the origin of the disturbance was very near the umbra of the spot. It appears that the rings die out when they cross darker regions of the spot. We have known from the time of Wilson that umbras exist at lower depths. Facing the lack of a supportive surface at the proper elevation, the rings die out. For instance, note the drop in intensity here in the penumbra, but without loss of the arc. Then note in contrast the arc in the light bridge of the sunspot here. Light bridges are essentially at the level of the photosphere. In these regions, the magnetic field should be weak or essentially perpendicular to the solar surface. It is well known that umbral regions of sunspots possess high magnetic fields on the order of several kilogauss. At the same time, strong magnetic fields running parallel to the solar surface can be found between sunspots, for instance, in this region where the wave completely dies. So now there is a region of high magnetic field but no ripple. What is happening there? It appears that the strong magnetic field is oriented such that it is preventing the disturbance from propagating. The solar lattice is essentially locked into position. Magnetic fields have not enabled propagation, they have prevented it. Yet if the solar material was indeed a gaseous plasma, the propagation of waves within it should be facilitated by the presence of magnetic fields. Gaseous plasmas can clearly carry longitudinal and transverse waves in the presence of magnetic fields, but the propagation of those waves is affected by the orientation of the disturbance relative to the magnetic field. Alpha waves are transverse waves and depend on the direction of propagation being parallel to the field. In the region where there is no disturbance, the direction of propagation is not materially relevant. Some wave fronts would have been essentially parallel to the field and some would have been essentially perpendicular. This is a sure sign that these phenomena have nothing to do with the physics of a gaseous plasma. The arcs are surprisingly well preserved in regions where the field is either weak, as in the previous example, or perpendicular to the solar surface. These two figures present a clear manifestation of a photospheric structural lattice which does not behave as a gaseous plasma, but rather as a true solar surface. We are seeing capillary waves and the presence of surface tension on a real surface. We are not witnessing P waves reflected from some mysterious region in the solar interior and striking some hypothetical surface as the solar physicists would have everyone believe to save their gaseous models. In closing, let us have a look at this plot. The sun is ringing like a bell and this is a graph of all the modes. Here the frequencies of oscillation for the body of the sun is plotted as a function of spherical harmonic degree, which is just the inverse of the spatial wavelength. Here is the important quote. The oscillation power is contained within specific combinations of frequency and degree, demonstrating that the surface oscillations are due to standing waves confined within resonant cavities. The problem for the astronomers is that once again, a gaseous sun has no distinct surface. It can never form a resonant cavity. A gas cannot confine anything. Resonant cavities have strict dimensional restrictions, and those do not exist in a gaseous sun. This provides firm evidence once again that the surface of the sun is real and that the body of the sun is indeed comprised of condensed matter. Well, that is all for now. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the videos to your friends and to your local astronomy club, 
support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below and I'll see you soon on our next video.